Good afternoon. Uh, first, my thanks to the Asia Society, uh, specifically also to Ken Wilcox and the board members of the Asia Society. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you, Margaret, for organizing all of this and making it possible. I'm very happy to be here. Not too long ago, I was having lunch in the basement of some New York restaurant where we had uh, a very interesting dialogue between Henry Kissinger and Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie had just written her book uh, about the network and the chessboard, a, a fascinating book if you haven't read it. And of course, uh, she wanted to chat with Kissinger about it because many people would consider him to be the ultimate chessboard player in the world of diplomacy. And she was trying to explain to him my style of diplomacy, which is much more about a network approach. And I do think that in that lunch and beyond that lunch, and in some of the experiences I'm going to share with you, understanding that the way we deal with each other is now far more complex than a chessboard is very important. The relationships we need to build in order to advance the affairs of the world, especially in this new complex transnational digital space we're all trying to live in, is very important to understand that there are many dimensions to building relationships. It's no longer linear. I'll tell you one experience. A few years ago, I was responsible for this organization that manages the 13 routes of the internet. The internet has a layer which we call the logical infrastructure, which ties all of the things connected to the internet. Today we have, I don't know, 35 billion things connected to the net, 78, 79,000 networks. How do all these things look unique? How do we have one internet? Because we don't have one network. We have thousands of networks. And that's because of something called the logical layer. And that layer has unique identifiers. The one you all know is the IP addresses, for example. That's a unique identifier. So the organization I was running, which was created by Al Gore, it was actually. That's why he said he created the internet. <laughs> in 1998, uh, is the organization responsible for all these unique identifiers of the internet. It's what makes the internet look like one internet. If the organization I was running and the resources it was managing would break up, we would literally have multiple logical internets. And one of the key assets I was managing in that uh, portfolio of things we were paying attention to were 13 routes of the internet. This is where every search on the internet has to ultimately resolve. Ten of these are in the United States. One is in Japan, one is in Sweden, and one is in the Netherlands. These were carefully placed back then. Of course, when I was responsible for this organization, and the number of users of the internet in China was just rising faster than anyone could see, it was a logical discussion with Chinese authorities that can we have one of the 10 routes in China? Why should the US hold 10 and we should have none? Sounds logical, sounds reasonable. Hundreds of millions of users in China. And so my task when I arrived at ICANN, uh, became also obviously a bit harder because just two months into my job, uh, a fellow called Snowden revealed some things. And that complicated the dialogue. That actually gave a lot of push uh, to the idea that we can't trust, frankly, the Americans to have 10 roots of the internet. We've got to have at least one of them in China. Of course, India chimed in and said, we've got to have one. Of course, Brazil chimed in, and the BRICS countries got together, and they said, we should at least have one in the BRICS countries. And my job as the lowly head of a 
small, he therefore unknown organization called ICANN, was to tell the Chinese and the Russians and all of these people, no, we're not going to give you a route. I'm a computer scientist. I've, I've, I've never really engaged in the art of diplomacy. But it's a good thing that I happen to be from an ancient country like Egypt. And I've learned, as uh, also a member of a very small minority group in Egypt, uh, to survive in a difficult neighborhood. And I had to use all those talents to figure out how to tell Dilma Rousseff first, and then to tell Premier Li second, that we're not going to give them a route. Uh, I spent two years doing this. This was not a quickie, <laughs> uh, because it's complicated. You have to understand the technologies, the capabilities, the dangers. The time I spent with Vint Cerf and Steve Crocker and Bob Kahn, the inventors of the internet, to also understand from them what would happen if someone got hold of one of these routes and wanted to do something with it. Very complicated. So good thing I was an engineer. But the more difficult part was to actually engage with China in a very open way to discuss the concerns we have about the route of the internet. I will tell you that there was a point that is not known, and I'm not sharing this typically publicly, but there was a point where China had actually built a complete separate route for the internet. And it was working. We sent engineers to confirm that. The idea was we would just turn it on. And if they did, it would have worked. We would have had a, a device pointing to IBM.com in China go to a completely different machine than all the other searches for IBM.com, which would go typically to an IBM server in Armonk or something like that. And that moment became difficult after Snowden because the Chinese got Brazil and Russia and South Africa. At the time, Modi wasn't in place, so India was in election mode, so they couldn't get India on board. And I went to Brazil because I felt that if I could change the mind of Dilma, we could probably stop this process. And we did. We convinced Dilma to back off. And once Dilma backed off, China engaged. Um, look, there's a lot of detail around this, but I wanted to just share with you that even in very delicate, complex discussions around digital rules and digital policies, there are ways for us to engage. There are common areas where we can actually find and uh, implement a set of guardrails that give us some common ground. It is possible. And engagement uh, requires art, not just laws. My son informed me not too long ago that he intends to uh, make a life partner out of someone from a different religion than ours. And my wife and I and him sat down, and we had to have some chats about that. And it was very complex to do that, because I come from a deep tradition. And I was trying to help him understand that in engaging with this person and with her family, that he needs to understand that there are certain values upon which you have some beliefs, upon which you have some traditions. And whilst our traditions were completely different, we actually shared most beliefs with them and all values with them. And that's, I used my experience with China to help him because it's very similar. When I was engaging with the Chinese government and leaders to avoid the breakup of the logical infrastructure of the internet, I would liken the values, beliefs, and traditions to 
common principles, guardrails, and policies. And I do think we were able to agree on common principles. For example, when I explained to Premier Lee that there are over 80 million places, people or devices outside of China that need to send and receive information from China all the time, and that if he chooses to have another route, those people would have maybe some difficulty in being able to conduct business and to share information as necessary. That became quite an issue. So I explained to him that the openness of this logical infrastructure is a common principle we should all maintain. Whilst we may disagree on certain things above that, but if we break that common principle of an open logical infrastructure where machines are not confused, where every machine has a unique identifier, it actually serves his interests and ours. So we established that principle. We said no matter what we disagree on, we agree on a common logical infrastructure. Now when you go above a principle and you get into what I call guardrails, and I hope today on the panel we talk a little bit about guardrails because I'm a huge fan of guardrails. Uh, some of us who come from the Western culture very quickly go to a legal framework. So we want to go to the policy. What is the policy? But some of us who come from a different background think first about a guardrail, something a little softer than a policy, a little, little less edgy than a legal framework. What could be a guardrail we could agree on? It's not always easy to agree on guardrails. I'll give you an example of one. The uh, Carnegie Endowment for Peace went out a few years ago to the countries that have nuclear arms and asked them, hey, which cyber weapons are you willing to give up if the other person gives them up? They spent a year doing that. How many of the nuclear empowered countries gave up anything, you think? How many agreed to give up one cyber weapon if the other would agree to do the same? Kind of like in the nuclear non-proliferation treaties. The answer is zero. Nobody would give up anything. Schools, hospitals, you name it, they tried everything. No one gives up anything. But then when they went to guardrails and started speaking about softer things, like facial recognition on weaponized drones, can we speak about the edges of that and how bad it could get? It's easier to get to guardrails than to hard rules. So I think in our dealings with that world, we ought to understand these three layers, principles, guardrails, and then policies. And just like I told my son that we have common values, we may differ a little bit on beliefs, but we definitely have different traditions. I think the same applies to digital policy in this new transnational world. We need to think of policies as being things that will end up being local largely, very much in the kind of uh, European concept of subsidiarity. But then when you come down to guardrails, I think we can find common guardrails. Not always going to be easy, but we can. And hopefully we can find common principles.